In today's conversation, we sit down with composer Alex Shapiro. Alex has written pieces really well known and often performed like Paper Cut and Immersion, and often her music combines electronics and sometimes even found sounds like whales from where she lives in northern Washington state. In this conversation, we take a look at how to be a kind, generous, and loving musician in a time when sometimes we have competitions around our music, and we know many of those have been cancelled recently, about how to be kind to ourselves and how to continue to improve our work by obeying and living up to our own standards rather than the standards of other people, and also about how to record yourself in your own practice. For a full list of the topics that we discussed and time points that you can click on to, check out the description below. Even those of us who are trying for great excellence in our work, you know, I'm not competitive with anybody else because I'm a composer. You know, I'm supposed to just sound the best I can sound for whatever crazy stuff is going through my brain. And I hold myself to really high standards, but they're my own standards. It's not competing with any of my friends and their beautiful sounds, you know, um, and hopefully for them, it's the same way. But if, if you can approach it that, yes, you have an end goal of excellence, but you're giving yourself permission to just be in the moment with doing the actual thing of making the music. <laughs> That's probably the best healthy place you can be. And of course, what we find is that when you are actually not thinking about it, but if you are just in the moment doing it, is when you tend to be the most authentic and tend to do the best. So if it comes full circle in leadership, if a team leader or ensemble leader can get the students to focus on just being in the moment and enjoying the process and being centered in that wonderful time when, you know, moment when time kind of stands still and you're just lost in doing the thing, that's when they're going to have the most success teaching. And that's when they're going to have the most success in the results from the students because the students are going to be that, that much more focused uh, without having to think about the competition. I think the comp competition and thinking about what you're doing can be really stultifying. And it's, I, we've all been there, like composing, every composer will tell you this, like you might be in the, in the groove, in the moment, in that magical spot. And then you, you're writing, writing, writing for like, I don't know, 20 minutes or something. And then suddenly it occurs to you that you are in that spot. And then you know what? You're out of the spot. <laughs> it just, you, you just can't get, quite get back there. You still write, but you're still not, you're not lost in the thought and laser focused the way you were up until the point you realized, you know, and there's lots of sports analogies for that too. <laughs> well, it's exactly the same in conducting, you know, you're, you might be, whether it's in a rehearsal or a performance and you're like, oh, wow, this is, this is really going well. And then you're like, oh, I'm not in it anymore. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's the minute you think about it, it takes it, it takes the magic away. And, uh, you know, it's sometimes the audience might be able to tell, sometimes they won't, but you can tell and you know the difference. So yeah, I think anything we can do as teachers, as professionals, as guide, guides, you know, whatever role we play to encourage people to, to do what they can to stay in the moment with their joy and with the very thing that drove them to want to play the clarinet or want to write music or want to wave a stick at people or whatever the thing is. Uh, that's, that's the good thing. That's the message right there. And what would be your advice? Because right now everyone is at home by themselves and that's a different <laughs> experience than particularly if you're the conductor, you don't have your ensemble there anymore. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a musician and you know, I think for lots of us, the thing we love is being with everyone else and making those sounds with everyone else. And that might not be possible for lots of people right now. What would be your tips for whether it's conductors or musicians on having that experience of just being in the moment with however it is we're making music right now? Well, there are two ways. Um, one is one does not involve the internet and does not involve trying to connect with other people. It's purely the joy of practicing or turning on a recording and conducting to it or studying a score or, you know, sitting down and writing. Um, it's the personal aspect of, of the most personal and the most interior way of enjoying it and connect and staying connected to what you love. And that's, that has nothing to do with, um, 
with anything communal. The other thing is when we do miss the communal and want to connect with human beings, we are using the technology now uh, to to find workarounds <laughs> in light of you know what I was saying at the beginning about you know we have limitations in in the technology right now. But there are ways, for instance, a number of us are exploring ways to get, um, in my case, let's say, accompaniment tracks that not only have a click, but they also have a tonal center, you know, one of my pieces or something. Uh, get those tracks out to the students with, and give them their parts and let them practice and then record with that track on their earbuds so that it doesn't come over the, you know, over their phone when they're recording or whatever they're using. And then they can record themselves playing their part in time and hopefully somewhat in tune. And then they send that file in to, let's say, the conductor of their ensemble. And the conductor can, without too much difficulty, because we do have good tech for this part, so the sequencing and the multi-tracking, they can assemble the files from all the clarinetists or the flutists or the trombonists, whatever. And it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to sound like everybody's in the same room. You'd have to do an awful lot of work as an engineer to, to make that happen. Uh, there are ways of doing it, but it costs a great deal of money and time. But for this purpose, it is one workaround to get people at least having fun, creating, being, particip being participants, putting in their two cents, practicing because they want to play the best they can, sending, recording and learning those techniques, be, techniques about being in a quiet space, using earbuds, understanding how to play against a click and how to not let the click limit you you know like like with conducting to a click yes you have to stay with it but that doesn't mean you can't get a little ahead or a little behind you just have to make up the time so these are all interesting techniques for conductors and and musicians to learn but it's one way of getting keeping people connected and um i've been exploring this with different ensembles and different uh, band directors and kind of guiding them with some tips of uh, ways to make it work and we'll see what the results are because i think a lot of people are sort of trying this kind of thing uh, we're in the dark ages right now of it and we've all been tossed into the soup <laughs> because of this pandemic um, which are words i actually never thought i'd be saying <laughs> in the context of what we do because of this pandemic in the time of the virus we are tossed into this but it, it's really interesting to see what people are going to come up with and the minute that the technology gets better uh, and it will exponentially. Wow, it's going to be exciting because now everybody's going to be somewhat comfortable with it and they'll be able to jump on and really, you know, make use of it. So. And I think that, again, brings us back to the importance of connection rather than competition. Right. Not that competition is not valuable or important, but that we need to come into spaces of competition with still this sense of um, love for the opponent <laughs> and that we're also it's not really about the competition it's about giving a great performance exactly it's about giving to the audience in this case and then and so that really this is the question of who's your audience. You're, if in a live performance, it's obvious who they are. You might be live streamed. It might end up on YouTube or whatever, but you feel your audience because you're playing to them, you know, because they're right there vibrating on the other side of the lip of the stage. Uh, and that gives you an energy. It's much harder sometimes to get that energy up for anybody if there are no people in front of you for whom you're performing. When even though you might know that potentially millions of people are going to see what you're doing. It doesn't feel like that when you're in your room by yourself, making your one part of the recording, or if you're even in a room with a few people, just making a recording without, uh, you know, without the live audience. And that's, that's again, the power of our emotions and our brains to, to conjure the energy level that, that we need. And that's something I'm sure you talk about all the time as a conductor with your ensemble members is where do they get that energy from? You know, and you're, you're again, we're back to sports, you know, kind of ch ramping people up and getting them uh, worked up a bit to give their best performance. And what does that mean? And it doesn't have to mean competition. And now we're saying it doesn't even have to mean a live audience necessarily, but it does have to mean connection. Because I think that, that most of us make music, not just because we like the sounds in our head, but because we want to communicate from the heart. We want to communicate emotion to other people. That's why I compose. I mean, yes, I, I can say I compose for myself, you know, it feels great, but ultimately I am always thinking about who is gonna hear this and feel what I'm feeling, I hope, while I'm writing it. And that is the big payoff for me. 
So you're conducting to share emotion with a whole audience of people, even if they're unseen to you. I'm composing for the same reason. And hopefully these players, whether they're students or professionals, they're doing the same thing. And, and that's an interesting mindset to think about. Well, you were talking before about um, us using technology and recording ourselves. And I think that that is maybe something that a lot of musicians have, have thought about, or maybe they've done it a little bit, but not invested a lot of time in. And that's a great opportunity for us to actually see what the audience sees and hear what the audience hears. Because mm -hmm. particularly if you're an instrumentalist in an ensemble, and I talk with um, ensemble members about this all the time, you might be so concentrating on your part, whatever it is, and um, even if you're really focused on expressing the music through your instrument, you might not be thinking about how that actually looks and how that comes across to an audience. Maybe you're playing something that's actually really vibrant and, and joyous and exciting, but, you know, if you're... <laughs> hunched over your instrument, that's a bit of a mixed message. And so for people to use those recordings of themselves and video themselves to say, oh, am I actually showing with my whole self what I'm trying to communicate with the music rather than, oh, the sound says it, but the visual does not necessarily say it. Because that's obviously what we as conductors spend all of our time doing. Is exactly. It's all about the visual. That's right. Are you conveying what you want it to sound like? <laughs> you, are, you are the key to that. No, that's so true. And especially now, again, that cameras are going to be in our faces as we do this. It's a great opportunity to, and as a conductor, it's a great opportunity to be teaching this to, to your players about, yeah, people, we've always said this to people, you know, what is the audience looking at? They're looking at you folks, you know, but the difference is they're looking at you from pretty far away usually. Mm -hmm. But that's what we're looking at is an orchestra or an ensemble of any size, sawing away at their instruments, blowing, whatever, whether they're hunched over or enthusiastic about it. Now it's going to be really different because it's much more personal. It's much more intimate in a lot of ways. The other thing that I thought of when you were talking about, you know, how do we communicate when there's no audience there is that our colleagues in... Uh, film do this all the time that's their right. whole job that's right uh, so we should probably be taking some cues from the drama teachers and the media teachers in our lives in our schools about that that's a great idea bring in drama teachers to, to teach the musicians for a class and, and uh, as if they're actors that's actually a great idea because you you probably know that when I'm talking about my electroacoustic music to an ensemble, especially younger people, but really, I think I use the analogy all the time, no matter how old and professional the, the musicians are, I liken it to green screen, green screen uh, recording and CGI acting. I always talk about how, you know, you can't hear the full effect that triangulates out to the audience between the track and you, your, you large ensemble, uh, and how that is additive and it triangulates not to you and not even to the podium where your fearless leader, the conductor is, but out to the audience and that's how it's designed. And so you have to have faith. I always joke that composing and, and playing is a faith-based business. <laughs> you have to have faith that it's going to sound really cool out there even though you can't hear it. And so you have to pay attention to what the conductor is telling you about how to balance and how to make it work because you can't sense it yourself. I mean, it's hard enough in a, um, if you were the second trombonist in a band of 90 people, you know, you're not gonna hear a whole lot of subtlety from all the other instruments, you know, as it is in a regular acoustic piece. But that goes really out the window when there's a track involved as well. And nobody can really hear the track that careful, that clearly, you know, it's coming on over the stage monitors and they can't really hear the balance of everything. So they have to act like they're that actor playing against nothing you know they and all the other thing is in an electroacoustic piece there are holes more holes perhaps than there might otherwise be for the section of the band which is known as the digital audio track to take over and do its thing sometimes and poke in and out with its own sounds and so there will be times when the players are wondering why am i not really playing anything here it seems like this is under orchestrated but it's not of course they they, they don't know where how it blends so they I always say it's just like that, you know, the actor having to pretend to be really scared about something and interact when there's nothing on the soundstage with them, just a 
camera person and a person with a boom, you know, bored, smoking a cigarette or something. There's nothing to play against. But it all comes out great when we see the movie. We'd never know that it's mm. not real. <laughs> it yeah, that's it. It's like a puzzle. I mean, you know, acoustic music is a puzzle. All music that has multiple parts is this delightful, wonderful puzzle. And writing it is, is like puzzle solving. I, I often think about composing as puzzle solving. I happen to like puzzle solving. I, so, you know, maybe that's why I like composing. But well, I know there's an in, somewhere there. <laughs> in one of the previous um, videos, uh, we were talking about how to listen for the melody if you've just got your ensemble part and and also how to um, read a conductor's score and the idea that yes. as ensemble musicians we have the one puzzle piece right. and our goal coming back to what you were talking about with listening is that as you're sitting there in the ensemble whatever instrument you're playing that you can see the lid on the box of the puzzle <laughs> and my like, conductor that. is always holding the lid the conductor has like the cheat sheet in front of them yep. the whole time. You're like, oh, that bit goes there, that bit goes there. But as an ensemble member, you know, it, it's your job to, can you go like this to yeah. be able to experience that whole puzzle? And I think it's really important to acknowledge that wherever you are physically sitting in the ensemble, you're going to get like a kind of skewed vision of that image. I had a student actually just this week um, who was sitting out the front of the ensemble that normally sits in the ensemble. And he said, oh, it was just so different. He said, it's, it actually it sounded so much better from the front. <laughs> and he, yep. he, he sits pretty in the middle of the ensemble. And I said, yeah, well, it actually, it sounds different everywhere that you sit. And, um, we're kind of just at the point in our rehearsals and if we get to have rehearsal next week, <laughs> yeah. um, that we were going to be mixing everyone up and getting everyone to sit in different places. That's terrific. To kind of feel, oh, oh, it's completely different when I'm next to the tuba versus next to the snare drum versus next to the piccolo or, or I've got different people around me that again is going to give you a different mix if you were exactly. on your little mixing board. Oh, that's great. I love that you're moving them around. I think that's so important. And I love your analogy of the picture on the top of the jigsaw puzzle box as you've got to look at the lid. And I've, I've often wondered why isn't it more common for individual musicians to be given a perusal score or something. I always offer it up, you know, to hmm. be given a score so that they can see. And if they can read one line of music, they can certainly read a score. It's, it's not rocket science. I mean, I'm sure, yes, we can guide them through, but it shouldn't be too overwhelming. Uh, it's always like what I say about, you know, mixing consoles. If you, if you understand what one strip is doing, they're pretty much all doing that, you know, repeatedly and just for different, different instruments. So um, it's, it looks more overwhelming than it is. And conductor score look, look, scores look scarier than they really are, uh, depending on the music. <laughs> But I love that analogy, Ingrid. That's so perfect. You know, you're well, holding up uh, the, to take the picture. <laughs> this is like a, a preview of a video that we're going to be putting up next week, um, which I was trying to get people to see, you know, who else has the same puzzle piece as you and that it keeps changing all the time. Um, and so we're kind of following this second clarinet part and going, oh, oh, the corner has it. But then, you know, on the second page of the piece, it's sometimes, but actually a lot of the time it's just one person and that's going to completely change. If you know, I'm the only person with that green spot on the puzzle piece and it's not going to be the same picture if people can't hear or see my green spot. Right. But then maybe it's a whole section of green and I've got to know I'm not the only green spot there. The trumpets right. have got the green spot and the second violins have got the green spot and we've got to be team green spot together. I love that. The other thing it teaches them, by the way, it gives them a wonderful composition lesson. It, it, it talks to them about orchestration. Mm -hmm. It talks to them about motivic development, like how is this motive or theme bouncing around? How's this rhythmic element bouncing around? Who's playing it when? Does it keep re re reappearing and when? Um, it's such a great jumping off point for understanding the structure of music. And, and musical form, which again, to me, it's all related. I mean, I, I'm not a particularly gifted instrumentalist, but I think that one, if you're playing, if you're conducting, you usually play an instrument, 
and you have a good sense of composing. If you're an instrumentalist, you should have a good sense of composing, uh, even if you don't do it for a living. And if you're a composer, you should have a decent sense of how every instrument works. <laughs> and you have to think when you're putting the piece together from the standpoint of the conductor. How is the conductor gonna be breaking this down to make it, sense of it into a large ensemble? I'm always thinking that way when I'm finally taking the music and putting it onto the, you know, in notation, putting it onto the page, because human beings have to make sense of it at that point. It's not just the chaos in my head. But you, I love that you're doing that, Ingrid. That is a wonderful um, thing to show them. You know? well, we're at a point right now, because of all of this uncertainty and unpredictability, where there's a lot of uh, fear going on in the world, understandably. What, what can we all do as individual um, artists to be kind of more kind to each other and more kind to ourselves because mm. i know that's something that you talk about a lot yeah and and kindness is the word and graciousness and and just being the best person that you can be to everybody else under all circumstances and also being kind to yourself as you say and you know it's so easy especially if you dare turn on the news and especially up here in the u.s i gotta tell you it's um it's pretty awful and it's really it can be extremely stress inducing if someone kind of gives into that and one of the things I would say to musicians is that they're so lucky to have their, their own ability to create their own inner peace. All of us have the ability to turn off the news. Not, it doesn't mean ignore what's going on in the world or ignore or be irresponsible as a citizen, but it means ultimately that inundating yourself with things that cause you great stress and worry does not really help solve the problem unless you're planning on running for office or volunteering your time 24 7 you know to, to save the world and th and many people do and that's wonderful but if you're not one of those people who's going to be doing that the best thing you can do is to put beauty into the world and also to put beauty into the immediate world of human beings around you the people your family and your friends and and your colleagues that you come the most in contact with um, it's, it's, it sounds hokey, <laughs> but I think that there's much truth to that. And the great thing that we have is solace. As musicians, we can play the most wonderful and compelling things. And when I say beautiful, I don't mean it has to be tonal and melodic. I'm saying whatever beauty is to you, whatever it has meaning artistically to you. It could be, you know, some <laughs> wild sounding, you know, piece, some, some wild expression, whatever it is. Um, if it makes you feel more centered, if it's something you can control, and lose your emotions in, that's a very positive thing. And that's probably a lot better than getting inundated with um, all the negative stuff that's flying around, uh, both online and you know on TV and everything else. So I think, but as you say, Ingrid, the kindness to oneself, giving one's, oneself permission to you know, unplug from some of this from time to time and find something around you that is of value and meaning and perhaps beauty. I'm mean, overusing the word, but like for me, as you know, cause you see my pictures on Facebook, et cetera, it's really easy for me because behind this camera, I'm staring at it. I'm looking at the Salish Sea and it's incredible. And I'm looking at bald eagles fly by as we talk. And I'm looking at a glacial volcano in the distance and, it, and a mountain range and it's, it's stunning. It's very easy for me to get out of um, my, the craziness of the world and just, inhale and take a moment and look at and appreciate something beautiful. And I think everybody, no matter where they live, can find something like that. Um, it could be any number of things. It could be a stuffed animal or an object or something that gives them joy that somebody gave them or, or a painting or whatever is in our immediate surrounding that can make us feel centered and, and that, you know, that the life you create around you ultimately is the one thing you can control. Now, you know, health issues aside, I mean, we're dealing with a pandemic. Obviously, if somebody gets sick, that's really, really scary. Uh, but right now, you know, if someone is healthy, they should take stock of the things that are positive in their life and amplify those. And I think if we're uh, stuck in houses or places that uh, don't have the incredible, gorgeous outlook that you have, that we can even just find a a picture or a yeah. video that makes us feel like that and you know close your eyes and imagine that you're there and absolutely that's exactly it find something
something around you in, in the room that you feel most comfortable in. Find something that has meaning. I mean, here I've got this little, got this little bone here that I found on the beach, you know, that I just, I, I could be in any room. I could be in a basement in Brooklyn, you know, and I'd be looking at this bone and I'd get lost in the, in the barnacles that had attached to it and how wondering how long the bone had been there and <laughs> on the beach and all these things. Whatever the thing is that can focus you and get you to, you know, lower your heartbeat <laughs> and lower your blood pressure is probably a good thing. And then there's the basic trite things like eat well, exercise, you know, be kind to your body, <laughs> don't abuse your body <laughs> with too much of anything outside of moderation. Um, you know, take care of yourself. And I think all of that relates to our mental health and, and that is where art comes in because art to me is a huge conduit for mental well-being and, and physical well-being. If you're making art, if you're connecting to sound that you're creating through an instrument, let's say if you're an instrumentalist, I think you mu there must be cellular changes going on in your body as you are playing. I'm convinced of this. I, I, I don't play really a wind instrument, but I play terrible flute, but I do play piano. And I know how I feel when I'm in the groove, you know, when I'm in the, in the, in the pocket of a moment playing the piano, I think my body cells are kind of rearranging themselves in some mysterious way. And it doesn't mean I'm playing well by Carnegie Hall standards, but it means I'm playing well by my standards in terms of emotionally, just like the beginning of this conversation. That's what we're trying to encourage in, in all of the students and all of the musicians is find your own center and your own place of joy and personal excellence. Not, com not competitive excellence, but personal excellence when you are where you need to be for yourself. And there's nothing that feels better. You know this, you know, I know this. <laughs> so we want to share our joy about that, you know, with other people and help give them a, be their guides to finding it within themselves. I am convinced that everybody has that and everybody can access it. Some people need a little nudge, you know, they need a little encouragement to access it, but I think it's there for everybody. I think that's one of the great things about being human. I hope that you enjoyed our conversation with Alex Shapiro. Make sure that you check out her website, alexshapiro.org, where you can listen to her pieces and look at preview scores of a lot of things. And if you've got any questions, you can email Alex herself. Here's her email. If you found this video valuable, make sure to share it with your friends, fellow ensemble members and other conductors. We'll be back tomorrow with another video. Until then, happy musicking.